So when you're planning your solar setup, your off-grid solar setup, there's a few variables that you have to kind of play around with to get something that's going to work for you. And it's hard to know exactly uh, what items to put where in order to have a setup that works for you without being overly costly. So the first thing is how much you can generate off of the sun. So the panels, the solar panels that you've got. And then beyond that, you've got how much storage you have in your batteries to be able to use that power later and to provide you a buffer even during the day. And then once you have storage in your batteries, power in your batteries, then you need to be able to invert that for your common appliances. So what we've got here is a setup that's going to get us three kilowatts or more of pull off of our inverter. We have a 3000 watt grow watt inverter charger. So it's handling the 800 watts worth of solar panels. It has a 3.2 kilowatt hour uh, BMW battery from battery hookup with a little uh, BMS to protect the battery. And then we've got the 3000 watts worth of inverting power off of the grow watt. We're really only testing the one scenario today, which is how much you can pull off of the inverter, which is important because you need to be able to run your appliances off of your inverter. We've got a 900 watt coffee maker, just your standard drip coffee maker. We've got a 1000 watt Instapot and we have a 1.4 kilowatt space heater. And yes, when you start calculating how much you need for your off-grid setup, you'll realize that space heaters or heaters in general are very costly in that budget. If you're able to run like natural gas or propane, that could be a more economical option for you because just being able to run a 1.4 kilowatt heater, just this itself could cost you a lot in batteries especially because you're typically gonna be running a space heater at night after the sun goes down. Without further ado, let's start up some appliances and see how well our grow watt handles it. So we'll get these all three started up. We'll run over to the grow watt. I'll show you that setup real quick, and then I'll show you uh, what kind of power we're pulling off of it. The first thing we're gonna do is get our coffee brewing here. I'm told that I should really put a coffee filter in. That's supposed to be your first step. So let's get that in there. And we need some beans. And let's throw some water in. Ideally, you would splash the water all over your electrical. That way, when everything turns on, it shocks you and you don't have to worry about this anymore. All right, so we turn that on. Oh, also, another thing I've got is these lights right above me. This is running off of the inverter. So you saw those flicker for just a tad. Um, as I turned that coffee maker on. So now let's uh, do some rice. I already had some water in here. Let's turn this Instapot on. We're gonna go to uh, multi-grain rice, and that will start. And I've got my coffee cup here from when that's ready. But you know what, it's, it's a little chilly out here and I've got my uh, short sleeves on, so let's start up our heater. So our Instapot is now running. Heater is running, that's nice, getting nice and warm and our coffee making. So let's run over to the grow watt and see how much we're pulling off of it. All right, so here we are at the back of our little trailer setup that's just got 800 watts of solar that's on two panels going in series to this grow watt, which has a built-in charge controller. This can handle up to 150 volts worth of solar. So with these two panels in series, that gets me right at about 100 volts. With a 49 volt open circuit panel that I've got, I don't think I would run a run, run, run three in series because in the cold winter months, if you get really nice sunlight, you could actually hit higher than the 49 volts and hit over 150 volts. This could go into an error state or hurt the controller itself and you'd have problems. So anyway, I think I keep this at two in series. So if I wanted to add more panels, which I could, because this could handle about three and a half kilowatts worth of panels, I would do two in series and then take another two in series and run those two strings in parallel back to the charge controller, which wouldn't be a problem. We would just have a lot of wires running out to the solar panels. We can see right now that our battery is at about 51 volts and we've got an output of 120, 119 volts and our load is actually at 105%. So we are running 3.16 kilowatts. So just so you guys can see this yourself, we're running 3.16 kilowatts. You can see we're pulling 59 amps off the battery. So that's gonna be the other thing is looking at the battery itself.
connections feel warm, which is good. It is quite uh, it is quite chilly out here right now. We're at about 50 degrees Fahrenheit ambient at the moment. But let's run over and see how our coffee is doing in our Instapot. All right, well here we are. We still got our resistance heater running. Going for, I'm gonna point that right at me. That feels nice. Um, so something to keep in mind too, is that we're running three uh, resistance elements here, basically, right? We're heating air, which is expensive to do, right? We're heating water, which is also very expensive to do. And that's because water has such a high energy density, right? Um, how much energy it takes to boil water it's a lot. And then we've got our Instapot, which is really doing the same thing. I was cooking our rice, so it's trying to get that water up to boiling temperature, so that's taking about a kilowatt as well. When you're talking about motors, um, they have a lot more surge that they put on the inverter. So when you talk about a 900 watt coffee maker, when it turns on, it's not going to surge above 900 watts. That element is going to take about 900 watts to start and 900 watts to run. If you talk about an air conditioner, if your air conditioner runs at about 500 watts, which is what a you know 5,000 to 8,000 BTU air conditioner runs, depending on how efficient your model is, it will surge to approximately three times what the continuous current is. So if it runs at 500 watts normally, then you would need something like a 1500 watt inverter to get it started. And that's that kind of depends on the inverter to inverter too. You've got the high frequency inverters versus the low frequency inverters. With this grow watt, this is a high frequency inverter, so it does not have the big coils inside. And the low frequency inverters with the big coils tend to have a much better surge capacity. So if you're cruising around Amazon and looking for inverters, you'll see that some of them have like a 3000 watt continuous 12,000 watt surge. And a lot of times if you look at the specs on those, they're gonna be low frequency and they're gonna be very heavy, which is not a problem. Um, that's actually preferable if you've got something that's maybe a stationary or you can handle the weight of whatever you're doing and whatever application you're in. You may as well get a low frequency if you need that surge capacity. So if you've got like a rooftop unit on an RV, a low frequency inverter might be a really good option for that uh, in order to get the surge capacity without having to get a massive inverter. This 3000 watt inverter can certainly start my 12,000 BTU window air conditioner without a problem. Looks like our coffee is about done, so let's get ourselves some of that. Help me quite warm me up over here. Seems a little weak. One last thing I want to do is grab my infrared camera and look at some of the parts of our system. Since we're running this thing at over capacity, I wanna see if anything seems to be getting hot. So let's do that now. All right, so here we are with our infrared camera. And the top right should show us the maximum temperature on the screen, which is 66 degrees, 67 degrees, which is not a problem at all. See so if we go over to the BMS, we hit a little higher. It certainly looks hotter. So let's run back over to the inverter and see how it's running. So I wanted to look at the output here because this is um, what you see in the picture there is the vent where the air is coming out after it hits all of its heat sinks. Now measuring the temperature of metal it's painted metal, so it should be fine. I was at 72 degrees in there, so it's a little bit warm. Let's see uh, what the kilowatts we're pulling right now is. So that coffee maker is done. It looks like we're down to 38 watts. Oh, there goes the, uh, that's probably the space heater. Let's go check on the space heater. We're only pulling a kilowatt right now. Looks like the space heater is kicked off. That's all right, we got our test in. Well, there you have it. Hopefully that helps you with your shopping with a 3000 watt high quality, high frequency inverter. I was able to overload it and I wouldn't want to do that for hours on end. 
But it's one of those things when you get up in the morning and you maybe turn the heater on, you turn breakfast on, maybe you've got a griddle out that you're, you're cooking on and you want to brew a pot of coffee. It's like, how many things can you do at once? And you can certainly budget it and say, you know, I'm only going to run one of these appliances at a time. Maybe you give yourself one plug on the countertop so that you can make sure you only plug in one thing at a time just to kind of keep yourself from tripping the inverter. There you have it. Let me know if you've got some tests or some worries. What is it that you've run into when you're searching for your own little off-grid system that you don't know doesn't make sense? You need help trying to pick out. I'm going to try and put some links down below for some power budget calculators so if you've got all these appliances you can throw those in the budget and see if, okay if i'm gonna run the instapot for an hour a day and the coffee maker for 20 minutes and the heater for three hours how much solar how much overall power do i need and then you've got to kind of back into it of how much of that power is going to be when the sun's down so you can see right now the sun's nice and bright so those panels are pulling in about 550 watts here in the afternoon sun of course they're pointed right at the sun if you got these flat mounted, you can't really count on that much wattage. But it's 800 watts worth of panels pulling in 550 watts pointed at the sun. And that's 550 watts that the battery isn't having to handle too, right? Because the charge controller or the, the inverter charge controller will pull in that solar panel wattage. And since you're pulling more off of the inverter than the solar is providing, then it takes what's coming from the solar. And then anything else that it needs, it grabs from the battery. Um, which was working well for us because we were pulling about 60 amps off of the battery and then about 550 watts off of the sun, which is about another 10 amps or so, which is handy because otherwise you would have been pulling about 70 amps off the battery, which would probably be fine in a burst scenario with that 60 amp BMS that I've got. If I was to install this permanently somewhere, I would size the BMS probably about twice as much as what the system needed and I would put in a dedicated breaker between the BMS and the inverter that is a, um, I'll put a link down below. There's one that doesn't care which direction the current is flowing. This is something I didn't realize until recently. With DC, we're getting off into rabbit trails here, right? With DC and AC, there's a difference with your breakers. If you're trying to do a breaker for 12 volt DC, it's not much of a problem. When you get up into the 30, 40, 50 volt range DC, and you try to use an AC breaker, you're gonna end up with arcing. So every time you turn that breaker off or it flips off, it's gonna arc and cause some welding on the contacts. You do that enough and it's gonna end up welding closed, which is not good because then it won't be able to perform its job of opening if there's a fault. Which is they actually have like a, uh, I know some of them, right? You, you have to deal with the arc. And the reason you're dealing with the arc is with AC, you go from high voltage down to zero to low voltage to zero to high voltage to low to zero to low voltage. So with a breaker, when you flip it off, it's doing that 60 times a second. When it goes to zero volts, it eliminates that arc. And then when it comes back up, the breaker's already past the point where that arc could jump. And so it's no problem. With DC, you've got a constant amount of voltage. So if you've got a constant 50 volts, 60 volts, running across those contacts and you flip it off and the space isn't large enough for that arc to distinguish extinguish itself then you can end up with welding right so what they do is do like an inert gas inside the area where the contacts are and then they put a magnet on one side to push that arc to the side and so then when you flip it off it extinguishes the arc and causes it not to cause damage to the breaker as it's turning off and the other thing is that it counts which direction the current is flowing and how these breakers are designed. So if you have a um, inverter charge controller like we have, right, that does both, you're going to be putting amps into the battery and you're going to be pulling amps out of the battery depending on what scenario you're in at the moment. So if you're going to put a breaker in there, then you need to make sure that it can handle current both directions and be able to trip both directions which you wouldn't think would be a problem, but apparently the way they design these DC breakers, it can be a problem if you get the wrong one. Now, if you're talking about a breaker between the solar panels and the charge controller, all you really need for a breaker there is something that you can flip off. Um, solar panels are only gonna generate so much amperage. You look at the short current amperage on the back, and these are 
about 10 amps, right? So all you have to do, because the breakers are there to protect the wiring, is get a breaker that's rated for at least 10 amps and you'll be fine. Even if you short circuit those panels, you'll only ever have 10 amps. So the wiring is not gonna be an issue. If you have a battery and you short the wires, there is no, uh, no practical limit on how much amperage can flow through. And so you definitely want a breaker to be able to eliminate that circuit if anything ever shorted or, or there was too much current being pulled. And that's the difference between breaker on the solar side and breaker on the battery side. Battery side, you definitely need something. With this system, we're using the BMS as a breaker. It's rated for 60 amps and it'll do surge above that. If I pulled 70 amps for too long off of that, the BMS would cut out, which would be as expected. And it's trying to protect the battery from too much current or a short circuit or what not. To summarize, if you're doing a breaker on the solar side, just make sure it's larger than your uh, current forever, however many panels you've got in parallel. And it's really just there for like maintenance or if you need to shut something off, you can flip that breaker. On the battery side, it is in fact a safety item. If you've got a BMS, and especially a programmable one, you could use that as the breaker and then use a manual breaker as a maintenance switch so that you can shut things off and do maintenance on the inverter or whatnot. But just some quick little tidbits on breakers there. Hope this was somewhat helpful for you guys and we had some fun with uh, making coffee and rice, which is apparently still making. I don't think we're gonna get our rice done. Join me next time, Bean Energy. Don't forget, if this was helpful and you're interested in some more videos, comment down below what you would like to see. Hit the like and subscribe if you would like to be notified when YouTube sees that I've got a new video out. See you guys next time. It's horrible coffee.